Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hi guys, uh, I'm trying to tie up some of the loose ends, many loose ends when it when it comes to history, world history, uh, and ancient Greece and the Renaissance period in Italy are two big, you know, places on a map with a lot of fog of war on them, if you know what I mean. And I want to explore them more. Names like Dante and Machiavelli, or like Plato and Aristotle in ancient Greece. And I'm going to look at, you know, a more broad Italy video here from Sweeney and see if I can find like a latch point where I can dive deeper into it. And so I'm, I'm sure it won't cover the Renaissance in part one. If there are only two parts, then maybe in the later parts of part one. Let's get started. My name's Connor. I like to learn about history. Original link to the video, top of the description. There's the door. If you're not ready to learn, you're in the wrong class. Home X is down the hall. Make me uh, spaghetti. Let's go. This video is kindly sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Use the URL thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Sweeney to support the channel and receive a free trial membership. Romulus and Remus, warrior twins from the Latin tribe, founded a city on seven hills. Enraged by jealousy and blinded by ambition, Romulus killed his brother and named the city after himself, right. Rome. This civil conflict between brothers would go on to define Italy's history with the civil war playing a large part in shaping the nation we see today. The Italian peninsula was a thriving hotbed of prehistoric civilizations, with all the basics of Bronze Age society such as metalwork and agriculture. By the time the Iron Age came around in the 8th century, these had coalesced into two dominant cultures, the Etruscans in the north and the Greeks in the south, who had settled the area slowly over time. These two shared writing, religion and culture with one another, having a massive... So these are native Italians right here. ...of influence right? over Italy. Their culture wouldn't last very long, however, because they were soon to be eclipsed by... Founded on the river between the Etruscans and a tribe called the Latins, Rome soon prospered and grew very powerful largely thanks to its strategic and defensible location, and they were ruled by seven legendary kings. The last of these kings, Lucius Tarnicus Superbus, also known as the Bad One, was overthrown by the people when his son raped a nobleman's wife. The scandal would force monarchy out of Rome, eventually collapsing the Roman kingdom completely. In its place, the Republic was born, ruled not by a king, but rather two consuls selected by the Senate. Roman society was divided into two parts, the patricians, who were nobles, and the plebeians, everyone else, who were represented in the Senate by an elected office called the Tribune. The Tribune was granted the power of veto, meaning the patrician senate and the plebeians often had to work together on policies that benefited both classes, contributing to Rome's success. Under the republican system, Rome prospered. They expanded their territory through both conquest and alliance, often being reluctantly dragged into wars in defense of one of its allies, who then made territorial concessions or became a client state in return. This cycle continued and soon Rome became the ruling state over most of Italy and Latin became the lingua franca, or common tongue. A rather small domestic dispute in the city-states of Sicily dragged Rome into an open conflict with Carthage, known as the First Punic War, which they ultimately won. The political fallout from this war was immense, and the two sides hated each other from that day forward. After two more Punic Wars, in which Rome was very nearly defeated by the Carthaginian leader Hannibal, Rome destroyed Carthage and annexed most of her territories. The Senate became more and more interested in securing Rome's place in the Mediterranean Basin to ensure another Hannibal never threatened Rome again. This would bring them to war with the three dominated by the Carthaginian leader Hannibal. Rome destroyed Carthage and annexed most of her territories. The Senate became more and more interested in securing Rome's place in the Mediterranean Basin to ensure another Hannibal never threatened Rome again. Okay. This would bring them to war with the three dominant Greek kingdoms. The city of Carthage and Corinth were both completely destroyed in 146 BC, and Rome became the undisputed naval power of the Mediterranean. Fast forwarding a bit to everyone's favorite guy, Julius Caesar. An ambitious politician and military leader, Caesar eventually landed a gig as the governor of Gaul. When recalled to Rome for his abundant abuses of power, Caesar made a huge power grab in returning to Italy with an army, plunging Rome into civil war. After Pompey's death, Caesar attained all political positions he could. Hey, what about, uh, what's his name? The third guy. 
that uh, got like Northern Africa and wasn't really important. After Pompey's death, Caesar attained all political positions he could, effectively becoming a dictator and emperor. As you may remember, the Romans weren't all too fond of monarchy, so you can guess what happened. With Caesar's corpse on the Roman Senate, the nation was again plunged into civil war between Caesar's adopted son Octavian and Mark Antony, paving the way not only for the Roman Empire, but also two very interesting Shakespeare ripoffs. Again, where's the third guy? <laughs> And wait, Shakespeare. Paving the way. I have to learn more about Shakespeare. Not only for the Roman Empire, but also two very interesting Shakespeare ripoffs. What ones? Uh, Hamlet or something? The winner was renamed Augustus, and his reign would soon be followed by the continuation of the Julio Claudian dynasty and a two century long absence of war called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Interrupted only occasionally by a few emperors whose mental faculties have been called into question. Nero. Rome became the birthplace of the Roman Catholic Church. So Caligula, seen and Nero, of the little I've learned about them through YouTube videos and the Biographics channel, amazing. Um, Nero almost seems to be involunt. Uh, I, I don't know enough. I just, they're they're pretty bad. Nero was tough, but in a tragic. I, I don't know enough. Never mind. Ironically, however, in the early days, Italy was very unsafe for Christians, who were frequently persecuted and blamed for many tragedies, including a great fire in the heart of Rome. After one succession crisis, the Flavian dynasty was established, ushering in a new era, famous for making Italy more diverse and multicultural, and the building of its most famous monument, the Colosseum, giving the Roman people the two simplest of life's pleasures. Panem, its circumstances. Bread and circuses. A volcano also destroyed the city of Pompeii, but I don't think the Flavians had anything to do with that. The Flavians were replaced by the Nova Atenine dynasty, famous for its five good emperors. Rome reached its zenith under this period both culturally and territorially. I know almost nothing about any of these ones, and Marcus Relli is obviously the most famous sounding. Commodus, the last of this dynasty, was assassinated by a gladiator named Narcissus, Walking beginning, Phoenix. you guessed it, Yet another succession crisis. The Severan dynasty like would usher in a period called the Crisis of the 3rd Century, where the number one cause of death for Roman emperors became assassination, not exactly a recipe for political stability. Rome would soon become very decentralized with time, being victims of globalization, cheap slave labor, inflation, and legionaries of barbarians who were more loyal to their generals who paid them than to Rome. 26 emperors were proclaimed in half a century, and the empire became politically split in half. The thing about this part is who were more loyal to their generals who paid them. So it seems like a big thing. So the main way soldiers were being paid was through, um, you know, something, what is it called? Spoils of war, like raiding and, and looting and whatnot. And so if you're in the situation and you got to keep your soldiers happy, there, there's almost going to be no call for surrender that you're going to heed, you know? And Because it's like, if someone surrenders, it's like, well, I still got to take all your stuff because I have to pay my soldiers. Is that right? Or did I, am I wrong there? Then to Rome. 26 emperors were proclaimed in half a century, and the empire became politically split in half. And even the capital of the empire was moved to the Greek city Byzantium, later renamed Constantinople illustrating just how volatile the city of Rome was becoming. Huns and Germanic tribes began to raid and sack the western half almost routinely, and the combined army were less able to mount a significant defense using their legions, since, hey, what did Rome ever do for them? The empire in the west would soon collapse completely by the 5th century. In its place, the barbarian Odoacer set up the more recognizable Kingdom of Italy, soon ruled by the Germanic Ostrogoths. The Ostrogothic Kingdom began a cultural exchange between the Latin and Germanic world, leaving huge imprints, especially in northern Italy, where they had established deeper roots. The empire, however, continued to live on in the east. Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian, with dreams of uniting the empire, conquered the Ostrogothic Kingdom in 553, once again bringing the Roman imperial light back to Italy and back to Rome. Much of the research and inspiration for this video was done using... Let's go part two. I'm intrigued. Part two. Go. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. 
the first 206 viewers who use the link below will get their first two months on Skillshare for free. The migration period didn't stop with the Ostrogoths. Around the same time, two tribes called the Lombards and the Franks had slowly moved southward in search of new land. The Lombards found themselves squeezed between the emerging Frankish kingdoms and nomadic invaders under the Avars, forcing them ever more southward. So I'm following pretty well. Um, obviously, there, there's a lot of stuff in here that's been mentioned before in other videos that I've, I've watched about Rome or about Italy in general. Rome falls, separated into two. There's this period where Justinian, Theodora, right, his wife, she was pretty badass too, and Belisarius. I got to watch that next video too. I, I hear there's a new Belisarius uh, Kings and Generals video. I think Kings and Generals. Um, but okay, I, I understand now. So it was split into two. West was recaptured by the East. Then it was uncaptured again. I really got to pay attention now because I'm clearing fog of war now. The Lombards slowly moved into central Italy, conquering the tired and war-ravaged countryside. They set up the Kingdom of Lombardy as well as two semi-autonomous duchies in the south, making Italy look Papal a lot States? more like a jigsaw puzzle than anything resembling a nation. The Byzantines struggled to maintain control of the area but retained at least nominal territory. The popes in Rome began securing this section under their direct control. Papal States. Right. Thousands of Italian refugees fled the countryside from the Lombard invasions and settled in the Venetian Lagoon, eventually becoming the legendary founders of Venice, the floating city. The Pope signed a law. You can look at this entire valley in, in Lombard, or Lombardy, France area. Uh, I'm not sure which river this is, but you can see like the Alps kind of goes here and then kind of does a curl around and then kind of hugs the coast of Italy of... Um, the southern coast on the Mediterranean of northwestern Italy. And it kind of hugs there and then goes down. But in between where it hugs there and goes down and the Alps, there's this, just this giant valley that seems like it's only a few, you know, meters or whatnot just from, from being a, a, an inland sea here or, or just being a, a much larger extension of the Adriatic. Right? This is the Adriatic? alliance with the Carolingian Franks and teamed up to fight the Lombards. Basically, I'm saying it's it's very low region there. Bards. In return, the leader Charlemagne was crowned the first Holy Roman Emperor, and the Papal States oh, were... Wow. The Pope signed an alliance with the Carolingian Franks and teamed up to fight the Lombards. In return, the leader Charlemagne was crowned okay. the first Holy Roman Emperor, and the Papal States... So that is a huge point right there. The Pope... The, the, the split... Okay. I love this. The splitting... The Papal States in between uh, Northern and South. I was going to say this so beautifully. So the north of the Papal States are where, are where Rome is here with the Popacy is a Lombard region that is hostile to them. And so they are calling on the Franks to help quell them and, and take them over. And Charlemagne comes in here. So granted full independent leader Charlemagne was crowned the first Holy Roman Emperor and the Papal Ooh, States okay. were granted full independence. The you guys, I know you can't see it, but that's a huge part for me. That That is an enormous part for me. So that is where the connection between Charlemagne and the Pope started. Conquering the Lombards. Also built walls around the Vatican to keep out pesky Arab raiders. Speaking of which, the Islamic Umayyads and the Abbasids began conquering parts of Sicily and Sardinia. The latter of which actually managed to repel their attacks, setting up independent states called the Judicati. Who saw that coming, right? Charlemagne's Frank conquering Pasquia yeah, 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 Arab yeah, yeah, independence. The popes also built walls around the Vatican to keep out pesky Arab raiders. Speaking of which, the Islamic Umayyads and the Abbasids began conquering parts of Sicily and Sardinia, the latter of which actually managed to repel their attacks, setting up independent states called the Judicati. Who saw that coming, right? Charlemagne's Frankish Empire splintered after his death, but was soon united by Otto I in Germany. The south was being conquered by the Normans. Okay while the Lombard kingdoms fractured into civil war. Around the same time, the Maritime Republic the Normans while the Lombard kingdoms fractured into civil war. Around the same time, the Maritime Republics began to increase in power and wealth. I'll go into more detail about these republics in a separate video since it gets pretty complicated. Definitely watching that video. That's crucial. 
The House of Habsburg inherited much of the Italian lands, putting them in personal union with many foreign rulers. Some of these rulers, like the Spanish Habsburgs and the French, fought a series Castile, Aragon, Silesia, Savoy, Sardinia. A series of devastating wars in among the states of Italy for control over the peninsula, called the Italian Wars. Only I further need, establishing Habsburg like need. the Italian land here, since it gets pretty complicated. The House of Habsburg inherited much of the Italian lands, putting them in personal union with many foreign rulers. Some of these rulers, like the Spanish Habsburgs and the French, fought a series of devastating wars in among the states of Italy for control over the peninsula, called the Italian Wars, only further establishing Habsburg control over the area. The Catholic Counter-Reformation of Catholic States against Protestant States... Okay, here is where I'm, I'm peeking my head up into... So this is where the Thirty Years' War is about to happen. I made the plunge into the fog of war, you know, and I've reappeared to, to a time where I am at least somewhat familiar with tangent with um, adjacent things, you know. Began the Thirty Years War, which is one of the deadliest conflicts of all time. Over in the east, uh, the Byzantines had recently fallen okay. to the Ottoman Turks and the Italian republics took in many intellectual refugees who brought Okay, Ottomans. With them, many long forgotten, and the Italian republics took in many over in the intellectual refugees who brought with them many long forgotten uh -huh. Greco Roman books. So it's thanks to the Ottomans that the Renaissance happened? And culture. The rich Italian cities had the money to waste on translating these books, resulting in the Renaissance, a rebirth of classical period culture. Oh, that's great. The Renaissance would also stimulate learning and the Enlightenment, bringing Europe out of the so called Dark Ages. The Enlightenment ideas became Italy's largest export, from faraway Moscow to nearby Paris. In Paris, it stimulated the French Revolution. As an unintended consequence in the 1800s, Napoleon's armies invaded Italy in his war with the Habsburgs. So, win some, lose some, I guess. In the Congress of Vienna, the borders were redrawn again following Napoleon's defeat. But the birth of an Italian national consciousness, as well as centuries of foreign rule, stimulated the unification wars, and the Kingdom of Sardinia spent the better part of the next century conquering the rest of Italy from the French and Austrian royal houses, under King Victor Emmanuel II and his famous general Giuseppe Garibaldi, finally unifying it into a modern nation-state. Except for the Pope who was still hiding behind his walls. The subject of Italian unification is extremely complex, and my friend Griffin from the Armchair Historian is actually covering this subject in detail. Really? That's right, James. Over on my channel, we've extensively covered this very chapter of Italy's history. The unification of Italy was a very long and drawn out process, full of numerous geopolitical and social events. Definitely watching that. In fact, the ramifications extended far past the peninsula itself, as the wars of Italian unification actually led many to seek new opportunities by leaving for the New World, causing the great Italian diaspora. So if you want to know more about the unification itself, yes. feel free to stop by at the Armchair Historian. I will. Thanks for having me, James. Please be sure to check out the video I collaborated on over at the Armchair Historian after this. The newly united Kingdom of Italy joined the Triple Alliance with Austria and Germany. However, when the First World War broke out in the Balkans, the Italians remained neutral, only switching sides to the Entente in 1915 in exchange for promises of new land. They opened up a they weren't friends with the Austrians. large front against Austria in the Alpine passes but made very little progress. A joint offensive in 1917 of British, French and Italian forces finally managed to put pressure on the crumbling Austria-Hungary. The war ravaged the young state, amounting some 650,000 casualties and more than a million wounded. In exchange, they were granted far less territory than they realized and the country was plagued with economic decline. This left Italy feeling alienated from their Western allies. Weren't they promised more of the Dalmatian coast here? Or uh, the Croatian? A young socialist named Benito Mussolini, himself a soldier in the war, used the turmoil to create a new ultra-nationalist movement called Fascismo. Mussolini was eager to expand Italy's holdings in Africa to prove his nation's racial superiority. A new Roman Empire. So, in 1922, he and the fascists orchestrated a coup, the March on Rome, installing Mussolini as dictator. Not long after, the fascist ideas and groups began springing up all over Europe, including Spain and especially Germany, where its philosophy laid the framework of National Socialism. 
Mussolini found a friend in Adolf Best Hitler friend. and they soon formed an alliance based on mutual support. Although both Hitler and other European leaders viewed Mussolini as weak and opportunistic. In 1940, Italy declared war on France and Britain, officially entering the Second World War. However, a lack of resources and tactical errors meant that advancing into France was pretty stagnant. The Italians also fought in North Africa, Albania and Greece, but had to be aided by the Germans to overcome the enemy. The joint invasion of Yugoslavia went very well for the Axis, bringing the whole of the Balkans under their control. The extra troops and resources diverted to the south disrupted plans for the Nazi invasion of the USSR, delaying the operation for over a month. Historians believe this to be a contributing factor in the Wehrmacht failure to capture Moscow. Historical. The extra troops and resources diverted to the south disrupted plans for the Nazi invasion of the USSR, delaying the operation for over a month. Historians believe this to be a contributing factor in the Wehrmacht failure to capture Moscow. No, it was going to fail no matter what. I've watched a million videos on this, okay? There's no way the Germany could have won World War II. They were screwed from the get-go. I, I have a little frustration just because I, I, I like to think there's always a, oh, what if? But it really seems like World War II, everywhere I turn, every new theory I have that could change it just gets smacked down by the fact that they didn't have the, the oil and the resources to get what they needed to get done. And beating the start of winter, since the invasion was launched so late. The Italian army contributed some 230,000. The delay of Operation Barbarossa, just one of the many contributing factors to the failed invasion of the Soviet Union. Also, Hitler himself viewed Moscow as merely a secondary objective with the industrial areas in Leningrad having higher priority. However, were it not for the delay, the Wehrmacht almost certainly would have captured the city before the onset of winter. Fun fact, I also learned that more Soviet soldiers died in summer than in winter, or more German soldiers died in summer than winter in Russia. So, you know, mosquitoes, disease. Thousand troops to the invasion with about 90,000 estimated casualties. Italy was invaded by a joint Allied force in 1943, which soon pushed their way up toward Rome. Italy surrendered and Mussolini was deposed, but the Germans invaded from the north to secure their southern flank. It is during this campaign that the Always Wehrmacht killed to... thousands of civilians and POWs, including over 7,000 Jews. The decisive battle at Monte Cassino was an Allied victory, leading to yet another Allied advance. Mussolini was captured at the border of Switzerland trying to escape, the anti-fascist populace then executed him shortly then, before the end of the war. And then like his body was, that was ugly. In 1946, the Italian countryside, ravaged again by war and famine, was given a referendum to establish a republic. The monarchy was abolished and the country became part of the Western democratic sphere of the Cold War. The communist members of parliament were expelled in 1947. However, the young republic suffered from economic hardship especially in the South, causing many to emigrate for better opportunities elsewhere, such as the USA, Argentina, and Australia. Guys, World War II is such a strain. It's just, obviously World War I is huge too, and then after World War II, it's like, everyone just switches to, to the Cold War so quick. It's like two years, boom, new enemy. And, and I think everyone kind of sees the, the giant vacuum left in the world from World War II, and it's like, all right, we need to fill it up with our ideas, whether it be, you know, communism, capitalism, whatever. Italy became a founding member of NATO, the European Coal and Steel Community, and its eventual counterpart, the European Union. Today, Italy still suffers from economic hardship as well. 93, my birth year. Well, as a large wage gap, but the economy is still growing. The switch to the euro in 1999 brought with it cheaper loans and investment opportunities. Italy is one of the most visited countries in the world, with Milan, Venice, like Rome, Naples, Genoa, and Florence being Rome huge cultural sure. and economic hubs, with some of Europe's most successful companies. A question I find all the time in the comments is, James, how do you make these videos? And then on hearing the answer, they take one look at the animation and illustration professional software, such as Adobe Illustrator and After Effects, and how complicated they appear to be, but we live in a world where you can learn almost anything online and that's exactly how I taught myself. I used video tutorials like this one on Skillshare on the basics of Adobe Premiere Pro by Jordi van der Put with 6,808 other students. 
but it doesn't just stop there. Skillshare has thousands of courses to help you learn new skills, such as the one I am taking now on Simple Character Animation by Fraser Davidson. Believe me, when I started this channel more than a year ago, I had no idea how to do even the most basic loop out cycles. Guys, it, it, fantastic videos. I, um, you know, especially the second one towards the end, you know, the really clearing up. I, I like the term clearing up fog of war because I, I feel like most people know what that means. I've played a sort of game where there is fog of war and I, I feel like that's the best way for me to describe it. And this cleared up a lot. Um, amazing video. See you guys next time. I'm going to play out the full video. The full so video whether it's business and finance, design, technology, or film, there's something for everyone at Skillshare. Italy declared their republic on the 2nd of June, 1946, and this is now remembered as the Festa della Repubblica Day every year. So the folks at Skillshare are offering the first 206 viewers who use the link below their first two months on Skillshare for free. Make sure to use that code. You're Thank you it. for watching. Remember to stop by the Armchair Historian for the second part of this collaboration. Absolutely, I will do that. Awesome, guys. Great video. See you next time.